right, we'll go ahead and get started. Good evening, everybody. My name is Kate Cornell. I'm the Executive Director of the Asheville Area Arts Council, and I appreciate you all being here for the first event in our Creative Sector Series. Um, first, I want to start by thanking our amazing sponsors, uh, especially our presenting sponsors, the Wortham Center for the Performing Arts, the Orange Peel, Asheville Art Museum, Blue Spiral One, Asheville Symphony, Hatchworks, a work, and Brunk Auctions. I also want to thank um, our Arts Coalition. This event could not have happened without our Arts Coalition, particularly the amazing leadership team of the Arts Coalition. The Arts Council formed the Arts Coalition in, two, in 2021 um, to help organize our creative community and make sure that we were um, reaching all of our arts professionals and arts businesses, because there are a lot of them here in Buncombe County. Um, so this is a series of 10 committees focused on different areas of the arts to make sure that we're hearing from the whole sector. Um, and we use this group to set our policy agenda and plan events like the one here at tonight. So a little bit about the Asheville Area Arts Council. We were founded in 1952. Um, we are the designated arts agency for Buncombe County. Um, though every arts council is a little different, we all still have three main duties, and that's accessibility, advocacy, and philanthropy for the arts. Our mission at the Asheville Area Arts Council is to keep the arts at the heart of our community, and we do this by supporting arts professionals and arts businesses in Buncombe County through connection, advocacy, and services for creatives. Um, one of the ways that we advocate on behalf of the arts sector is through data and reporting. Um, and we put out a report in May 2021 looking at our Buncombe County creative sector from 2015 to 2019, five-year analysis, because it was our thinking that we needed to understand where we were pre-pandemic before we could understand the impacts of the pandemic. Um, and so we just followed that up with a second creative jobs report that came out last month, looking at the creative sector from 2019 to 2021. And so a couple highlights from those reports, um, from 2015 to 2019, creative industry jobs in Buncombe County grew 24%, reaching approximately 14,000 jobs. From, by 2019, creative industry sales had reached 1.6 billion, representing 44% growth um, since 2015. As COVID struck the nation in March 2020, many creative industries faced significant challenges, including up to 14 months of closure due to state mandated health restrictions. Jobs in Buncombe County creative industries declined 18% from 2019 to 2020. And by 2021, jobs were estimated to be um, 2,200 jobs below the 2019 totals. The majority of these job losses were in arts and entertainment industries under leisure and hospitality with historic sites and independent artists, writers, and performers making up 50%, 56% of the losses. Sales had reached 1.6 billion in 2019 and declined to 1.5 billion in 2020, and they increased very little in 2021. Manufacturing top sales in 2019 and saw an increase, it was one of the few sectors that saw an increase um, of 2% by 2021. And among core creative industries, these sales gained 41%. So it just shows you that our creative manufacturing industries did pretty well during the pandemic actually. Um, so you can see this full report on our website at AshevilleArts.com. We're also currently working on three more studies. Um, we are conducting the Arts and Economic Prosperity Report, which is led by Americans for the Arts. Um, so we are the partner for Buncombe County. This is done every five years as a way to measure the economic impact of our nonprofit arts organizations. Um, we're also partnered with Land of Sky Regional Council, um, to conduct a creative manufacturing study of Western North Carolina and assess ways that we can help build the um, infrastructure for creative manufacturing, um, since there's a lot of opportunities there right now. 
And the third piece is we're conducting a survey to measure the impact of our outdoor events, um, our outdoor festivals and events in Buncombe County. Um, so those results should be out next month. Hoping in time for our city candidate forum. Um, so as part of the creative sector series, we have these three candidate forums. Um, the first one is tonight. The second one is on September 28th with county candidates. All the commissioner candidates have confirmed. Um, the, and the third and final event is with city candidates, city mayor and city council candidates. And they've all confirmed as well. So I hope you'll join us for those events as well. Um, in November, we will have our State of the Arts brunch, where we'll be giving an update, and more of an update on the health of our creative sector. Um, the Arts Council has some very exciting announcements we'll also be making, and we'll pre be presenting our annual John Cram Arts Leadership Award. So I hope you'll be able to join us at the Orange Field for that event. And then the final event in this series is in February, date to be decided once the election is over, um, and that will be a mix and mingle with our elected officials at the Art Museum. So tonight, um, we have our state candidates. Um, Billy Martin got a little mixed up on the date, and so he's not going to actually be with us tonight, but we have Everett Tillo, Eric Eger, Lindsay Prather, and Caleb Rudolph. And if we're not able to join us tonight are Warren Daniel, John Anderson, Julie Mayfield, Petit Facta, and Molly Rose. Um, I did hear from both John Anderson and Julie Mayfield, and they wanted me to express to you all how much they regret if they could not make it tonight and how much they support the arts. So, some ground rules. Um, the moderators will ask the questions of the candidates. They will call on the candidates. Each candidate will have up to two minutes to answer each question. Um, moderators um, will time the candidates. Um, there is a timer right there on the table, right there in the center of the moderator table. Um, it will turn yellow when you have 15 seconds left and red when it's, you have to stop. Um, the audience can also participate through minty.com. Um, so if you want to pull out your cell phone and go to minty.com, um, the code is 6605-2852. And this will actually be on all of the question slides, so you don't have to memorize this right now. Um, but if you want to submit questions for the candidates, we'll try to get to them. If we don't get to them, we'll share them with the candidates. So without further ado, I'm going to stop talking and I'm going to turn it over to our amazing moderators for tonight. We have Managing Director of the Wortham Center, Ray Jeffrey, and Buncombe County Schools Art Specialist, Laura Mitchell. Welcome, thank you for being here tonight. Um, Representative Rudo, if you could just start off and please introduce yourself and tell us more about your personal background and experience in the arts. Great, happy to. Can, can y'all hear me just move the mic thing? Okay, I'll move it. Uh, so I'm Caleb Rudo, I'm the representative for District 114 and running uh, for election November. Um, I was appointed in February after choosing Fisher stepped down. Um, my quick background is I grew up in Asheville, a proud product of Asheville City Public Schools. Um, I'm a data scientist is my kind of day job. I got a master's in policy from the University of Texas, uh, Austin. Um, I'm a returned Peace Corps volunteer. Proud to say that my, I'm the only Peace Corps volunteer in the General Assembly. Um, I have a few other onlys. Um, I'm the only person in the General Assembly who was a, a lead singer of a David Bowie cover band. John Ingers, you know, he did that, but. He surprised me too. Um, I'm the only person in General Assembly that you know, was in the Cuban salsa dance group, was a clogger for a long time. You know, I'm the only person, as far as I know, who used to run experimental arts and music events. And that's because I grew up here. And, and that's because you know, I grew up in the arts and I grew up country dancing, busking downtown. And, and if, if you're from here, if you spend any time here, you see that arts are in this place and they're, they're everywhere. And, and I internalized that. And, now, I really think that has affected me throughout my life, both kind of how do we address problems creatively, uh, how do we have a sense of joy in our lives. I gave some of y'all my rainbow glasses for my campaign, um, <laughs> but we're trying to bring kind of performance and enjoyment into the campaign cycle of politics because that's important. That's kind of what Asheville is. It's a place where you know, we both can do serious policy and do serious business, um, but we also, I think, have always prioritized joy. Um, and that's you know a big part of my campaign, a big part of my background. So, 
happy to be here. Thanks so much for organizing. I'll pass it on. <laughs> Hi, I am Lindsay Prather. I am running for NC House District 115, which is a western and southern Buffalo County. I uh, grew up in Wake County, but I transferred up here in college uh, and have been here ever since. I graduated from UNC Asheville with a degree in sociology as a North Carolina teaching fellow. And I taught in high schools here in Buffalo County schools for six years after that. Um, I like to say that I am art adjacent. Uh, I am not an artist myself, um, but I have always been around the arts. I have always been surrounded by musicians. My brother graduated from the music technology program at UNC Asheville as a self-taught musician. Uh, my husband is a musician as well, um, self-taught from when he was a kid. Uh, he was a band school kid. Um, and you know, growing up outside of Raleigh, outside the capital city, never even realized until I moved away how lucky I was to have museums and galleries and festivals just at my fingertips. Um, so we were always involved in that, always checking out the art scene in, in Raleigh and in Cary when we could. Um, of course, took the obligatory piano lessons when I was a kid. Um, never knew until college that my grandmother was the one that had paid for this. Uh, it was Aww. really important to her that we had that exposure as kids, um, no matter how busy my parents were. And so uh, I'm extremely passionate about the arts, in particular their involvement in education and public education in our schools. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to thinking about that. Thank you for having us. All right, thank you all very much for having, for having us. Um, my name is Eric Ager. I'm running for House District 114, which is the um, eastern half of the county. I say Fairview, Swan and Oak, Black Mountain, Barnardsville, East Asheville, and downtown to the river. Um, as the district. Um, I'm, I'm married to an incredible lady, Rachel. Uh, I'm at Pensacola. And we have four kids. Um, I grew up right here in Fairview, um, just down the road here in, in Fairview at Hickory Neck Gap Farm. Um, and I uh, went to Reynolds High School and then went on to Naval Academy and uh, was commissioned as an incident um, at age 22. Uh, I spent 25 years, really 25 years of my working life in the Navy, um, serving both as a helicopter pilot and as an international relations uh, expert on, on the Navy side. Um, you know, and, uh, and and you'd be surprised how much art there is in the Navy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, from the Naval Academy's, uh, you know, great uh, acting troupe um, to, to many other, uh, what we used to call folks or colleagues on the back of the ship of an aircraft carrier in the day. But, but my life in the arts started much younger. Started really at my my aunt Susie's uh, dining dining table. Susie Hamilton, probably many of you know. Um, you know, she tried to teach us how to paint still lifes and make scrimshaw out of turtle shells and, uh, and work with clay to make amazing things on, on the pottery side. Um, and I was also, you know, fortunate enough to be part of an amateur theatrical society in Fairview, the Fairview Amateur Theatrical Society. Growing up, um, better known as Fats. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and, and put on some great shows. Um, you know, some of you may have, may have seen them, but uh, you know, Fiddler on the Roof, Oklahoma, Guys and Dolls, all a big part of my upbringing. And then, you know, even acted in a couple of plays growing up at UNC. And it was, you know, really, I think this had a huge impact on my life. Um, and uh, you know, I'm certain these early experiences have really given me a different way to look at the world. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, my name is Everett Tillo. I'm actually running for the same district. And when you talk, spoke about growing up in Fairview, we kind of grew up together. So he's bringing back on memories. I think there was a foggy picture of us together in Oakley somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> so if someone can get a picture now, then we can share it. <laughs> uh, folks, you know, I uh, started out my career as a professional baseball player. Uh, I had the opportunity when Major League Baseball would collapse to go in, in, in the leagues you know, a couple of years there. Lucky enough that I had a, a background from college and a family cared about me where you know I could fall back into business. But my family has been farmers. Um, I've worked construction. I've been in the hospitality. Um, you name it, I've done it. And, you know, I was explaining to someone earlier, sometimes I get a little bored at work. So, you know, I want to switch careers. Um, you know, I'm just lucky enough that I have a degree to fall back on when my parents supported me to get it, where I have the ability to do that. 
Um, in a nutshell, the reason I'm doing it, uh, you know, running for this office, is, you know, I just see not enough neighborly things going on. And when I say that, why is art important to me? Well, it's the essence of Asheville. It generates revenue. It's been here since I can remember, since I could walk. And so many people say, well, that's just art. They don't need that money. They don't need that help. That's what inspires imagination. Your millionaire is sitting in the office calculating numbers. What does he usually have on his wall? A piece of art, a photograph, something that calms his mind where he can gain his thoughts in coercion so he can do his job effectively. Just because I can't draw, just because I can't sing, trust me, I can. I mean, I will if you guys want to laugh, but, you know, it inspires imagination. And that's what keeps me going. The individuality from each artist and each person's represented in Thank you. All right. Our next question is about pandemic recovery, because no one's tired of talking about that right now, right? <laughs> Katie gave us a lot of the history of the creative industry growth in Buncombe County. As she said, it grew 24% between 2015 and 2019. And COVID, of course, struck the nation in March 2020. Many creative industries faced significant challenges, including, as we know very well at the Wortham, 14 months of closure due to state-mandated health restrictions. Jobs in Buncombe County creative industries declined 18% from 2019 to 2020, and by 2021, jobs were estimated to be 2,259 below 2019 totals. Sales also declined in 2020 and increased very little in 2021. Ongoing health concerns, employment challenges, both continue to impact the local creative sector. What role do you think the state should play in the long-term recovery of these businesses? And let's start from the other end with candidate Patilla, please. As we all know, you know, COVID's affected everything. And I could not imagine an industry such as this where starving artists were not only shut down on what they love to do, but now they have no revenue and income in the food service industry and the jobs that we're carrying home to pay the bills while they fulfill their dream. So many times we, as politicians and people, we argue, and we need to come together and think of a long range plan that affects the whole community. That's gonna be a stimulation of the economy in this area and in other areas in North Carolina. You know, imagine pre-pandemic, the film industry was here and they were covering us up and you know, all these people would come up to me Ever, and I'm so excited they want an extra here. If I just send a headshot, you know, that's part of the creative industry that we lost. And when we lost that, we lost people shopping within the community. So we need to bring that back. We need to start doing tax breaks as a state for the creative side to get movies and so forth back in here. Give them that tax break. I have no issue in doing that because it generates so much revenue for the folks living and supporting the community in the area. So we have got to come together as a whole, as a community, Republicans, Democrats, independents, libertarians, and we have got to work together to get the economy back where it was at, get our tourism industry. I know a lot of folks in Asheville do not like tourism. I, I see it on some sides, but folks, that's the backbone. That's what comes in and pays for that one photograph that inspires that businessman on his office wall to create something wonderful for his team while he employs other folks. So my whole thing is let's work together. It's gonna to take both sides, it's gonna cross the line and let's stimulate the economy and do it the right way and get the industry back in here to support every local artist, no matter what they're doing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Candidate Ager. Thanks. Uh, well said, Everett. I think that was, uh, you know, you, you said it all and now we'll all struggle to sort of fill in the hole. I mean, pandemic was a once in a generation you know, challenge. Um, and I think it hit the arts and, and the creative industries harder than any other industry in, in, in the country and in, in the world. You know? um, and, you know, though many of you in this room and, and artists around, you know, certainly in this great community of Asheville, uh, you know, 
demonstrated a lot of resilience by helping each other out and, and doing all these things. Government does have a role, and and, and government did play a role um, to some degree. Um, you know, we just had the, the North Carolina budget pass. Um, you know, and had uh, you know, cares for arts grants. It was, it was you know really important. You know, PPP loans from the federal government, um, and then you know the, the increased funding for the grassroots arts program um, was was really important to. Uh, you know, to keep in our economy afloat, especially in a place like Asheville. Um, but the work is not done, and I do worry that we're going to slowly, you know, everybody's going to sort of cheer and say the pandemic's over, um, and we're not going to uh, continue to support uh, a lot of businesses and creative industry that that suffered immensely over the last two years. We really need to uh, make sure that we don't lose that focus. Thank you. Candidate Prater? Yeah, um, so definitely agree with that. I mean, a lot of it comes to, to funding, right? We've got the Business Recovery Grant Program here in North Carolina that just closed its phase two. Um, I'd like to see a phase three. There are still businesses out there that have not gotten the support that they need. Um, and so increasing funding, expanding that program if we can, and, um, and also outreach and education to these organizations and to these businesses to make sure they're aware of those programs that they can apply for. A lot of these things, I know that we've come across these issues before, you know, it's great, we've got these programs and these initiatives, but if nobody knows about them, then they're not doing anything, right? So making sure that we are specifically meeting people where they are, increasing that outreach and education to make sure they know what programs exist now. Um, funding the arts is, is part of our country's tradition and history, right? Teaching American history, all of our big federal funding programs included investments in the arts, the New Deal, the Great Society, right? We've always recognized how important it is to invest in our arts, especially when we're in times in our country of recovery. Um, and so I absolutely think it's a priority. Thank you very much. Last but not least. Great. Well, lots of great answers. Um, you know, I think I think of artists in the pandemic like essential workers, and the, you know what got us through this time was music, and it was you know events that we could share with each other online, and it was plays, and and I, and I really think we shouldn't forget that. In the same way, we shouldn't forget other essential workers who we work through, because that's how you make it through tough times. Um, I, I support all the policy solutions of I think more funding, helping businesses get back on their feet. I don't think I have much to add there. I, I also think there's a big picture piece here, which is affordable housing and you know, Medicaid expansion and how do we make it easier for everybody to live here and, and that's artists and, and all sorts of folks. So I think there's a way that we need to just make Asheville more affordable generally um, and give those grants. Um, I'll also say um, this has been my proudest moment. One of my proudest moments is a rep. Um, Shaky is the old bar down by the river. Um, great music venue, um, lovely place. They had a hard time getting their agency permit and they called my office. So if you have a problem, call your rep. Um, and I got on Friday and I was like, drop everything, you got a bar in trouble. You got to fix it. <laughs> yeah. and, and I made some calls to ABC and got this open on Tuesday. And I was one of the first people in there to, to think of purchasing the bar. And that's, you know, that is not policy, but it is the kind of the organizing and the, the, way the, business, the way the government should work. And I think that's the kind of, you know, um, you know, not get up and go, but the kind of enthusiasm and the kind of way we need to support the arts when they're in trouble. Because they will be in trouble. And I think that's the kind of constituent services side of this job. Um, that's also probably the more fun side of the job is having a gin and tonic or a cool new bar that you help try to get started or get over the right time. But um, you know, this relates a little bit to um, you know, cutting red tape and trying to make sure that arts businesses can open up in the right way. And I think you know, there's a lot to be said on that. Um, and it's something I look forward to working on uh, in the general public. So A plus schools of North Carolina is a whole school transformation model that views the arts as fundamental to teaching and learning. Schools develop a creative culture in which the state's mandated curriculum is taught through collaboration and multidiscipline integration. With the arts continuously woven into every child's learning experience. Established in North Carolina in 1995, A plus schools is a signature program of the North Carolina Arts Council and is the longest running arts-based whole school reform model in this nation. There are currently 67 A plus schools impacting over 30,000 students across North Carolina. Three of these schools are located here within Buncombe County. 
at Plaxton Elementary School, Black Mountain Primary, and Arts Bay Charter School. Participating in APA schools has been proven to increase overall school performance, increase the number of students achieving grade level proficiency by as much as 22%. They show the largest and quickest gains among marginalized students, improve attendance, reduce disciplinary problems, increase teacher satisfaction, and increase levels of community and parental involvement. Do you feel that expanding this program into more North Carolina schools would be a good investment of state funding? Candidate Ager, can you start us off? Thanks for the question. I, mean, I, I think the answer is pretty simple. I, um, you know, I, I support the expansion of the program because it's pretty clear that the outcomes are, are there. Um, and, and, you know, it's clearly working to improve the, the outcomes for students and for students. So, I, mean, I don't think it's a, a tricky question, um, but I do think there's there is a, there is a voice in the community and in the country that that says that you know art in schools is unnecessary. It's extra. It's, it's not that important, um, you know, and especially that, that voice rises in times of scarce resources. Um, but it's clear to me that you know, artistic expression is really essential to what it is. Um, and we've got to, to make sure that we maintain funding for those programs, even when you know, resources are scarce, because it's, it's those students who get an artistic, you know, creative education who are gonna solve the world's biggest challenges. They're the ones who are going to solve the problems of engineering, in architecture, in medicine, um, and it's it's that sort of outside the box thinking that, that art encourages that, that really is going to be important um, for future success. Yeah. 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 Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. Absolutely. So you know. The argument for expanding this program is the argument for liberal arts education, right? It's the argument that, you know, they say students that are starving school now, by the time they graduate and enter the workforce, 50% of the jobs that exist then don't exist yet. Um, we can't continue to prepare students in the same way that we have for the last 200 years. Um, and there are teachers out there that that want to be more flexible, that want to implement this in their classroom and, and are being hampered. And so expanding this program absolutely would, you know, obviously lead to more students and teachers being able to participate in, but it would also send that message that the liberal arts is important, that we need people who can be creative, right? Even if math is your passion and you want to become a mathematician, right? Having a background in the arts and in sociology and history is going to make you a better mathematician. Um, we all know that, right? So it it benefits the entire school, not just you know the students that were lucky enough to have a free period where they could take an art class in, in the other schools. Um, not only that, but one of the issues that we're really seeing in our schools right now is that that lack of interest in students, right? And so there's a big push these days in the classroom. Especially, you know, at the very beginning when we're teaching children how to read, focusing more on finding out what it is that they're interested in and pulling them in that way. And then once they have that interest and that spark, they work harder to learn the words, to learn the vocabulary, to learn the spelling. And so coming at it from that end, instead of focusing just on books because it says this book is right for the student at this age. And so having those schools with that more flexibility and the more interdisciplinary options and pulling arts into those different classes that might not typically have arts is gonna is gonna put that spark in those students who don't know what to do. Great. Yeah, a great answer is, you know, I was at I did Dixon not at Claxton, but not I admire the program and really think you know, I echo you know, my other candidates here uh, and the importance of arts and you know not just for art's sake but for learning coding you know i'm a programmer you know and, and because i understand music i can see patterns in a different way um you know i think there's all sorts of ways that arts help people manage their emotions and what we all learned over the last year is that you know, there are lots of ups and downs and you know i know when i have a bad day i play a song on the piano or i you know dancing has always made me feel better and, and that's not just a tangible stuff in school it's the stuff that Helps people be more resilient, helps people lead more joyful, you know, rich lives. Um, 
I'll also say, you know, that's you know, not just the benefits in the school, there are all sorts of ways that the arts breaks down boundaries between people. You know, when I was in uh, Peace Corps in Zambia, there was a great salsa dance group in Osaka, the capital. And, and it was just, and you could meet somebody, you could dance with them, and it was a way of bridging the gap. And I think we've all had those moments in arts where, where the world feels smaller and where we feel more together. And, and those are super important moments. Um, they're important moments in the school, and they're really important moments um, you know, for our country as a whole. So, you know, fully support, um, you know, funding the program, uh, expanding it, um, because I think, you know, the arts makes us smarter, it's making people more creative, better to solve problems, and they, they make our lives better. Thank you. Well, I, I agree with all the candidates up here. Uh, you know, I, I want to see expansion in that area. Um, you know, we as a society now are so busy, and you know, it takes a reminder from my son when he looks at me and says, Daddy, what was your favorite game on the tablet? Huh? <laughs> well, what did you do? Well, I would draw. Or I would read poetry. My mother, you know, that's where I get my artistic background from. She wanted me to be well cultured, wanted me to read a book. And so many children don't have that opportunity at home now because of how busy families are. And it's not the family's fault, it's just society now. The society demands more from us from work, from everyday life, and just traveling. So if I don't have time, which I make time, but a lot of families don't. But if that parent just does not have time and they're working and they get me, at least I know that at school they get at least some experience. So their imagination starts to generate. Or they're not sitting there on YouTube in the, the corner being reclusive, non social. They start to learn that mind that stimulates it. The, those brain receptors start going off and, and they start creating. They go outside. Next thing you know, they're outside playing. I mean, that's a novel concept today. Um, sometimes my kids, it's like on hen's teeth. Uh, as the old <laughs> saying goes, you know, to get them outside, you know, I have to beg. But then I look and they're building a fort. They have the opportunity to do what I've done for that creativity. Who knows? Maybe my son will go into business. I know he loves football. Maybe he'll be a professional football player. But the whole thing is, his mind is starting to register things different across the art and needs expanded throughout the school system. Thank you. Many of us in this room, many organizations in this room, are recipients of the support from the North Carolina Arts Council. Arts Council grants are one of the many ways that we sustain and advance the diverse and widespread network of arts organizations and artists across the state. These funds, as you probably know, reach into all 100 counties of North Carolina with more than 2,500 arts and culture nonprofit organizations creating and sustaining innovative arts programs. They contribute to the quality of life and to community vitality. Arts events, as we've mentioned, leverage additional spending by their audiences and local restaurants, shops, and businesses. These activities are centerpieces of downtown revitalization and essential to attracting new businesses as well as residents and visitors. They're also critical resources for schools in providing arts experiences in and out of the classroom that enhance learning. Increased funding to the Arts Council would strengthen the infrastructure of this vital industry and help build resilient communities and economies in both urban and rural areas across the state. The question is, do you feel that additional grant funding for the North Carolina Arts Council to support arts programming would benefit the state and its citizens? And candidate Craver, I believe it's your turn. Yes. <laughs> um, yes, absolutely. I mean, you know, a lot of what we talked about is is reasons why we need to expand that funding for sure. Um, you know, one of the, so after teaching high school and most recently, I've been working at UNC Asheville in the admissions department, uh, which includes a lot of um, tours for families that are visiting, deciding whether they wanna to come to UNC Asheville. Uh, and, you know, our, our initial kind of info session for the tour only has about five slides on it. And one of those slides is the arts culture in Nashville. 
Uh, that is one of the things that brings people here, not just as tourists for the weekend for a festival, but entire families, students who are investing in this community, and students who, if they can afford to, plan to stay in this community after they graduate. Um, and so it is absolutely something that draws people to Asheville, and we have to be thinking long term about maintaining that. Um, in addition, one of the things I really like about that grant program is that there's, you know, some flexibility for each of those counties, right? So nothing, every county is a little bit different and has different needs. Uh, and so in a place like Asheville, you know, maybe we've decided that we want to prioritize focusing on minority-owned arts businesses, right? And um, maybe in other areas, it's more of a focus on the historical interpretation trails, right? And so being able to provide those funds, but then also working with the community and determining what's most important and what's really needed and needs to be prioritized there is incredibly important. Um, but I don't think anybody here would deny that the arts scene in Asheville is, is one of the main things that draws people here. And yes, of course, we absolutely have concerns about balancing you know, local life and, and tourism. Um, you know, we can talk about, we needed to talk about the occupancy tax fund earlier, but that's another way that we can continue to push to allow more funds to come back here into the community, in particular for our arts communities. Um, but yes, that's something that, that we have to focus on. Again, you know, as a country, that's that's what we do. We've always acknowledged how important the arts are to our communities, and we need to continue to do that. Thank you. Let's mix it up and go back to Canada later. All right. Uh, I'll go with Lindsay's answer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I think one of the great things about this program is, is, as she mentioned as well, but but the local decision making and the, the ability for, for local arts and cultural staff to help see what what uh, what things look like. I mean, it's it's to me it's not that complicated. Um, you know, especially in a town like Asheville, in our wider region here in Western North Carolina. Uh, arts, arts is what brings, is what drives the economy here. It really does, and uh, I, I think it's it's easy to forget that. Um, but but a, a tourism economy is 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 really dependent on good um, artistic expression throughout the city. And so these kind of grants allow allow us to do that and allow artists to get out there and express themselves. I think that's that's really. Fantastic. Uh, candidate Tilly. I agree with my counterparts. And, you know, folks hear grant and they assume it's negative. Well, it's a handout. To me, it's a business loan, so to speak. Because when you start supplying the art community with these grants where they can survive, then the business starts booming. You're giving them the, the ability to live their dreams. It's like I live my dream playing professional baseball. Though it'd be short, I got to live that dream. So these grants are necessary and they need divided not for political views, but for the community. Everyone should get a fair share. Everyone should be able to come together as a community and debate. You know, debate the issue. Well, this is why the actual symphony means more than so and so. This is why, you know, the River Arts District, where, where we have all these creative people who are put some of this grant money, this is why they need it. So, you know, in today's society is a lack of communication. And I would love to see that money come in to stimulate, you know, I keep saying stimulate the economy. Because, you know, I, I, I'm realistic, you know, I'm in business. And I know the effects that can be made with a great arts community. You know, uh, someone spoke with the architect occupancy tax. Well, that's people visiting the community going to the hotel. Now we have more money there. Now this one, county commissioners and the people that get a fair share of it, they can divide that up in other areas to expand, to put more trails in if they choose to, widen the sidewalks, make it more convenient for the artists in city limits and within the county. Because it's, it's expanding, folks. It's all the way down into Chimney Rock, you know, closer to Chimney Rock, it's into Hendersonville, it's in the Black Mountain. I mean, it's catching wildfire. Let's support it. Thank you. Thank you. And Representative Bruda. Thank you. Yeah, lots of great answers there. And I think the key for me is, you know, arts 
an investment, you know, arts and business. There's lots of different ways to talk about this, but um, it's good for the economy. It's good for our quality of life here. Um, just because everybody did such a great job talking about that part of the question, I want to talk a little bit about the schools piece of it. Uh, I was uh, in uh, Madrigal's choir. Does anybody answer Madrigal's choir? Yeah, good. good arts crowd. I love it. Uh, the very dorky medieval choir that had a medieval dinner every year, their fundraiser. And, and I went to high school, and that was my favorite thing to do. And, and it was a thing that you know you look forward to. And, and you know, I went to, um, and I yeah, was in there with uh, Alex Fisher, Susan Fisher, youngest. And so, you know, I um, I know I'm not alone in that. And you know, those programs and, and supporting and you know and adding arts and instruction to schools who can't afford it mean a lot to other kids. You know, I I went to tour uh, Irwin in the district and talked to the band teacher and he said, you know, we have a hard time getting kids to come to school. And a lot of kids like that. And you know, he said, well, a lot of kids come to school because of band. And, and, and that's really important for you know, having better outcomes in school for everybody. It's, it's important for, you know, for educational outcomes. And if you know about some of these schools, they don't necessarily have the resources to have all of these amazing arts programs you know, in their school full time. So having that additional funding for additional you know, arts in these schools is really important. And I know I benefited from, from it you know, growing up here in Asheville and we go on field trips here and actually my mom's office used to be in the den where them. Um, yes, I know Ray from running around the halls as a kid. Um, but you know, we, we grew up here in this arts community, and and I remember benefiting from it as a student. And I still think you know that's not just a good investment um, economically, but it's a good investment for our schools and smart district teachers. So on July second, twenty twenty, Governor Roy Cooper signed Senate Bill six eighty one into law. And this bill, among its other things, created an arts high school graduation requirement and for the state of North Carolina. So this law requires that every student receives one arts credit, a semester of either music, visual art, theater arts, or dance, somewhere between the grades of six and 12 in order to graduate from high school. And this begins with um, our sixth graders this year. This is the class of 2021. <clears throat> While arts programs are offered to all students throughout elementary school, program offerings drop off significantly by the time students reach middle and high school, and in some cases, suffer from lack of funding. So, given the challenges of the pandemic and the fact that low income students who participate in the arts throughout high school are five times less likely to drop out and twice as likely to achieve a college degree, this graduation requirement may seem um, and it is a valuable tool to make up for lost learning and support our students when they need it the most. So, do you feel that additional funding for the enhancement of middle and high school art programs would be a good investment of state funding, not only to implement this new graduation requirement, but also to improve our student outcomes. We'll start with Andrew today. You know, I, I have a daughter. <laughs> Most people don't know this, but she's autistic on birth. And because of that, art helps her calm down. It helps her rationalize, especially with the pandemic hit, that I need a break. You know, when we see how students are succeeding, be more successful in five times, you know, less opportunity for dropout or to leave, it's because they're looking forward to something that clears their mind. I would like to see it expanded more. What's wrong with having two credits? Let's have them make them have one credit in middle school and then one in high school. Those folks, our brains need that relaxation. People do not give art credit enough for our survival as a human race. I mean, it dates back to the dawn of time, the dawn of man. Even cave paintings on a wall. What was that? That was art. It was a form of communication. It makes you an individual, it makes you different. Now, one of my daughters, she, she can draw anything she sees and she'll look at it. She'll say, But Daddy, I made a mistake. Yeah, but that's what it makes it yours. And somebody's going to appreciate that. And that's what our children need to learn in school. So 
So we need to expand on this for they have more self confidence or they know something like, hey, I made that mistake, but now it's mine. I own it. And that makes it special because I created it with my mind and with my time and with my focus. So we need to expand the program. We need more art teachers. Some of the favorite things in middle schools when I first got was able to take art. It was by uh, my baseball coach, Luke Morris. Um, great individual. First thing I know, threw a baseball for it. Didn't look exactly right. And that's where I got that it's yours, though, and it's unique, and I love it ever. I'll give you a name for us. Thank you. Thanks. Stay back down the list. Thanks, Everett. That was, uh, yeah, I mean, a great demonstration and story about how, how important art is and learning about art is and mental wellness. Um, I think it's also really important to, to realize that, that art inspires and, and nobody needs inspiration more than middle schoolers and high schoolers um, every day. Um, that, that inspiration uh, keeps them in school. Um, you know, it, it helps them do, uh, you know, the hard, diagramming sentences and learning about geometry that, that maybe isn't quite as fun, but it's very important. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that's the role that, that art plays in the schools um, is that it, it, it really helps inspire kids. And, and it, it, it introduces concepts that, that you don't get in uh, an art way or something. So, um, you know, I'll just leave it there. Thanks. When I, well, I'm a mixed first year, I'm in favor of the graduation requirement, and I um, would love to see our expansion in schools in general, uh, middle school and high school. Yeah, absolutely. We do see a huge drop off, and, and that's a big concern because that's also when we see students who previously might have been engaged start to disengage more and more. Um, when I was in middle school growing up, I was lucky enough to, to attend an arts uh, magnet school in Raleigh. And um, so I was having a conversation with my parents about what, what my chosen involvement was going to be. Um, I couldn't play any instruments because the recorder doesn't count anymore in middle school. <laughs> uh, I did not want to be on stage. Um, and, you know, it's not an answer. I took tap jazz one year. Uh, that was interesting. But, um, and so I was really struggling with, with how I was going to move forward. And that's when my teachers told me, well, have you ever heard of tech theater? And I said, no, no, I don't, I don't want to perform. No, 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 tech theater, you get to be behind the scenes. And it just opened up this whole new world for me. And so when we think about adding graduation requirements, right, we're not, we have to, we have to open our minds a little bit in terms of what those options and possibilities are, right? The students that are taking shop class, right, they can be building sets for theater. Um, the students that are interested in, you know, computer science, right, they can be creating storyboards or um, animated music videos for our music performance students, right? There are ways to, you know, creating costumes, lighting and sound, things like that. Um, there are ways to get students involved that isn't just, you know, you're drawing a paper or you're, you're singing a song. Um, and so I think it's really important to make sure that people understand those different options. You, know, you talk about, um, you know, music is what kept you right being you know, in the arts is what kept you in school my husband was the same way he was a damn kid he got diagnosed with ADHD at the age of 32 um and so he always struggled with school he knew that he had issues um but band is, is what kept him here great yeah just, just a few more things to add I think a lot of great stuff has been covered um you know I, I think um you know it, it talks about educational outcomes it's really helpful you know, we talk about mental health um I think there's a whole world of kind of creativity that we underestimate how we live our daily lives and how important that is of problem solving. And, and I remember that, you know, growing up and, and playing music, it was, you know, if you failed, it was kind of a part of the process. And, and that was, that's a really important thing for us to realize as adults to not develop a feel of fear of failure or to become you know, familiar with that feeling. And I think you learn that in the arts, which is, is really, you know, I, has really helped me for everything else that I've done. You know, moving forward, I think there's also a way that you know, when you talk about confidence in students, um, you know, I think yeah, us, us being at Geeks, Choir Geeks would always you know, say, you know, we're developing confidence in, in teamwork in the same way that you know, sports 
athletes are um, in, in, in high school and, and middle school. I think those kinds of things are sometimes undervalued in the arts, but they definitely teach you leadership. They definitely teach you problem solving. They teach you, you know, how do you lead people? And I, and I think ultimately that's a part of the job in politics too. You know, we sometimes we overestimate the amount that logic helps, and we underestimate the amount that kind of emotional connection helps. And I think the arts does that, and that's an important skill for. For students to have, you know, both so that they can graduate and kind of deal with obstacles, but but also as they move on in their lives, I think um, for me it's continued to to provide benefits and you know, fully support, um, you know, they, keeping the requirement and expanding. Okay, our next question is about creative manufacturing. And if you've been around the last couple of years, we know that global supply chains have been disrupted thanks to the pandemic. So if you've tried to get building supplies or a computer or sometimes even something from Amazon, it's been difficult. But that's not necessarily bad for us. Disruptions in the supply chain have actually caused more businesses to book to domestic manufacturing for companies to fulfill their needs, leading to faster turnaround times, new jobs, and less negative environmental impacts. Manufacturing topped Buncombe County's creative industry sales in 2019 and saw a large increase in 2021. Some of these uh, creations are musical instruments, custom architectural woodwork, millwork manufacturing, pottery, ceramics, plumbing fixture manufacturing. Those are among the top core creative, uh, creative manufacturing industries to see an increase in sales and jobs. There's a study being done right now by the Land of Sky Regional Council of Government to examine the ways to scale creative manufacturing businesses. The Asheville Arts Council is also working with Riverbird Research on an assessment of current creative manufacturing industries across Asheville Metro and Western North Carolina. And those findings, just so you know, will be published in 2023. Do you feel that the initiatives to build and strengthen creative industry infrastructure are in the best interest of Western North Carolina and its residents? And let's see whose turn is it? Representative Ava or candidate Ava, excuse me. Sure, thanks. Thanks a lot. I mean, I certainly think that that initiatives to build and strengthen uh, across the board are, are, are I, I think you know, the background there. On creating resilience in the economy, um, and this is something that we're, we're all figuring out how to do as the supply chain disruptions. I, I think this is a great opportunity, um, really, to to that, that, that all people in Western North Carolina can, can get around. It's a bipartisan issue. Increasing manufacturing in our state is an issue that can really um, be an issue that, that, that brings the whole state, and especially when it becomes when it's, when it's artistic and high value added items that, that really can drive. Um, and so, you know, I think it's great that the land of the sky is, is working on this issue. Obviously, that's that's a bipartisan piece too. The former um, Republican uh, legislator who runs the, that institution is supported by, by, by lots of other people. So, um, I, I think you know, that's what we do. I said. Thank you. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, I know all of us probably have, in the conversation we've been having people in the campaign, so many times it comes up, we have to diversify our economy, <laughs> right? And and this is absolutely one of those areas that, that we can do that fairly quickly, right? We've got the people here, we've got the interest. And just like Eric said, um, you know, that was one of the first things I thought of when I read this question too, is yeah, this, this is a no-brainer that everybody on both sides of the aisle should, should be behind. Um, you know, one of the other things that makes Asheville special, you know, in conjunction with our art scene is the you know, Appalachian crafts history that we have here. And so I think, you know, as long as we have people that are continually making sure that we're, that we're staying true to that and that we're embracing that, um, then we can stay true to being Asheville while also increasing this manufacturing and then and, um, and including more artists in that. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think um, it's it's a great testament to what artists do and creatives do. 
when there's an obstacle, they think about how to get around it, and they think how to use their resources to find a niche. You know, a lot of artists are almost all entrepreneurs in some way, and so I think one is a great testament to the community that the community is able to respond in this way and fill in these gaps. Um, you know, I think I, I've, you know, in addition to kind of, you know, how do we support them? I think we have some great resources here. We have, you know, AV Tech, you know, all sorts of, of programs for help to learn these skills too. So I really think there's um, a way that we're well placed to do this. Um, I also think, you know, I've worked in um, a few maker spaces and there's lots of opportunities that we can work together. And I think that's something that Asheville has been really good at, which is, you know, how do we kind of seek across um, our own interests and try to find a way that we can collaborate together. And I, I think this group is a great testament of that. There's lots of people in the community who came together to hear from candidates about what they care about. And, you know, I think for those of you who aren't familiar with the kind of maker space concept, there are all sorts of ways that there's an economy of scale to having a place where people can all create and build together. The tools are more available. We've been doing this kind of in the food sector as well in Asheville. So there's kind of some some models for it. So you know, I think it, it's a great opportunity to uh, diversify our economy. It's a great opportunity to leverage our existing resources. Um, and yeah, I want to see what the fun things look like. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, candidate Tilla. I think the other candidates other covered it well, but you know, so I want to tell you a little story. Years ago, I worked for a group called Living Stone Construction. They were just starting out. And they had me doing some tile work in West Asheville because I was the best tile cutter. That was back when, you know, $350 a week, I was making great money. Well, toward the end of the job, they looked at me and they said, Ever, uh, you've done such a great job, we're so proud of you. Those tiles, the young lady that we're putting them in for had it imported. Each one's hand painted. And they're $900 a piece. I did not want to cut tile for them anymore. After that. <laughs> <laughs> I still to my but I, I guess what I'm saying here is, you know, if you have the facility producing these tiles here, and we have the artist, that's a way to immortalize that artist's uniqueness. And something like that, where they can put their art on that tile, it can be mass produced when it catches on, and guess what? It lives forever now in people's homes. And would people in Asheville pay for that? Why, heck yes. And nothing else for the quality, because that's one thing the pandemic has taught us is quality has went just sideways. And a lot more people are buying within the United States, buying local, because they would rather spend that extra 25 cents extra 50, in some cases, extra $50, because they know they're getting the quality and it's going to last. So let's focus on that opportunity now. Let's bring the industry back and let's get our artists hooked up with them before they can do their designs and immortalize themselves and make money while they're doing it. And show the community what Asheville is. It's a community of family and friends for business, art folks, Everyone alike, we can work together and we are family. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, State Museum of Western North Carolina. In 2003, Congress established Western North Carolina as one of 49 national heritage areas. The rich culture of this area deserves to be preserved and shared with the establishment of a Western North Carolina History Museum. Though there are 17 state museums in the uh, eastern part of North Carolina, western North Carolina only has one, the Mountain Gateway Museum in Oldport. A funding bill may be introduced in the upcoming long session to support the North Carolina Department of Natural and Cultural Resources in its efforts to finally create a western North Carolina museum of history and culture for all the citizens of the region. Do you feel that adding cultural resources in Western North Carolina, like a new state museum, would be a good investment of state funding? Maybe it's me. I'll go ahead and start. Um, that's, and this is I don't, uh, Representative Akers, one of his, his pet projects. So I've, I've talked to John about this before. And it, it's really exciting. You know, I think there's lots of ways that. Um, Western North Carolina has an amazing, fascinating history. People who visit the museum, um, we need to figure out how to get it done. And um, I'll talk a little bit about kind of my next steps on it, but I want to talk a little bit about what it's like being there and how do we get things done and why we don't have a museum already or more museums here. 
part of that is because we need to figure out ways to work with other reps to try to get Western North Carolina to work together, to grow together. You know, we have folks from across the aisle, and you know, there are lots of ways that we need to make better pitches about this benefiting everybody. Um, and, and, you know, if you look at the budget every year, Eastern North Carolina always gets these big bills for, you know, general spending bill for everything that happens here. Western North Carolina doesn't. Um, and, there, and I think, you know, one of my priorities as a rep is trying to figure out ways that we can make the pitch, you know, of Asheville being its own thing. And then we have some conflicts with other parts of the state sometimes, but also that we can see the bigger picture that, you know, we all benefit from this museum. Um, you know, we all benefit from Western North Carolinians and reps working together. And, you know, I think I'm, I'm encouraged to see, uh, you know, everything talking about arts and that being an across the aisle conversation. And I think, you know, I've talked to the reps in the General Assembly. Um, I may be the only person in the David Bowie cover band who's there, but there are lots of artists who love art there. And, and we don't agree on everything, but, you know, trails, uh, arts, you know, protecting the environment, there are some, there are some things that we do agree on. And I really think a big part of this job is finding that middle. And, and going for it as hard as you can so that we get something done. Um, so as a former history teacher, I, this absolutely excites me. I would have been thrilled to, and I wasn't even crazy about field trip days, but I would have been thrilled to bring students to a history museum on a field trip. Um, I think there's there's a lot of reasons why this would be fantastic. One, yeah, I think it would it would acknowledge and put a spotlight on a history that is not often talked about in Berkeley. Um, you know, one of our, uh, I don't know if you guys know Dr. Darren Waters, former history professor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's, he's doing it across the whole state now. Um, and, you know, looking into the, the history of West North Carolina and really trying to draw a spotlight out here. Um, a, B, I think we, we have a lack of, sometimes family-friendly activities in Asheville, um, you know, ones that aren't alcohol-centric, and so more museums, more places for entire families to hang out is always a good idea. Uh, and B, increasingly as working virtually is becoming more and more popular, people are, are looking for different reasons for why they're moving to areas, and greenways, trails, clean water, cultural resources and activities to do are things that people look for when they're deciding where to live and where to settle and where to raise their family. Um, and, you know, the potential for partnerships with universities and high schools and elementary schools is, is just um, immense. So, yeah, it's very exciting. Thanks. Fantastic. So, everything is Baker. Thank you. Well, I grew up with, uh, you know, a father as a history, who was a history teacher, so I was definitely steeped in the the history of, of this area um, growing up, and I, and I think that's really important. My daughter, as well, is a great lover of museums, and, 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 and while I like museums and, and enjoy going to them, I mean, she she will drag me through eight-hour days in museums, um, and, and I think, you know, and, and I really do think that they are a tremendous resource, especially for young, young folks who are trying to understand history and, and, and many other things as well. Um, but most importantly, I think it's it's a great opportunity to immortalize the people that came before us and, and tell the story of, of you know, from the from the Native Americans to the to those uh, Scotch Irish settlers um, you know, to the Vanderbilts to to the farmers who scratched out living in these hills in the early days. Um, you know, the the world changes and, and, and the people change and populations change, um, and so I think it's really important to to tell this story. Um, you know. In the region, um, because it really is a unique story. I don't think it's told. Yeah, that's all. Well, you know, this area, born and raised, you go through any part of the Blue Ridge Mountains, and, and, and there are stories, as Eric stated. You know, I don't want them forgotten. I don't want anything forgotten. You know, a lot of people do not realize uh, if you go toward uh, Andrews Geyser and you walk up a trail, there's a Tomb song halfway in the National Forest that has an unknown soldier there from the Civil War in the middle of nowhere. So, how many people know that? Not many. Uh, my ex professor, William Forston, he would take me in a metal detectors and, hey, let's go look, let's go look, find cannonball, and so forth. There's such a rich history here that it seems to 
start to be forgotten. And I'm proud of where I'm from. I'm proud of what it is now. I just wish we could all get along a little better. I mean, that's that that's that's the only thing because it, this anything you see, even TV shows, moonshiners, what's that about? That's about the mountain community. You know, it's a rich history in that. From prohibition to where you get a lost hoe on the Tennessee line, where they manufactured moonshine there, and, and, and it was forgotten about because they kept arguing which sheriff was going to take care of the problem, and they did. But that's part of history that I want my children to learn and other people's children and visitors to come see because I am really proud of who I am, how I was raised, and where I'm from and where I'm going. And I want to take this community right along with me, and I want everybody in the world to know this is what we're about here. Thank you. Um, so we are not going to get to audience questions. We now know about how many questions we should add and how many we should, how much time we should leave for the audience. Sorry about that. I did get a big crack out of the Thomas Wolf question. I think I know which one of you asked that. Um, <laughs> that. <laughs> but I will um, pass that along to our candidates and they can answer uh, if they want to and share those responses. Um, I just want to give a big round of applause for you guys coming out today. On the 28th, talking to our county commissioner candidates, and I hope that you will come and join us. Um, that event is being moderated by Stephanie Beckman and Liz Wayland Talent. And that's all I have for you today. Thanks for coming out. Woo.